In this video today, we are going to be talking about how Marvel almost destroyed the comic book industry. All this and more coming right up. Stay tuned. Hello to all my comic book people, Dante D here and welcome to the channel where we talk about comic books and other geek stuff. One can't really argue with the success that Marvel Comics has had in the comic book industry over the years. However, I'm sure you probably didn't know that on one occasion, Marvel actually almost destroyed the comic book industry as we know it. Right now you're probably all like, whoa, hang on a sec, hit the brakes. Marvel almost destroyed the comic book industry, the company that gave us some of the most popular superheroes ever, like Spider-Man, the X-Men, Captain America, the Hulk. How could this company have almost destroyed the comic book business? Well, to answer that question, we have to go all the way back to 1961, a time when comic book publishers were struggling to stay relevant in an era when comic books were heavily persecuted under this crusade that psychiatrist Frederick Wortham was carrying out against the comic book industry. From the ashes of an almost destroyed comic book industry rose the brand new Marvel Comics, the Marvel Age of Comics, and the Marvel Universe with this comic book right here, Fantastic Four number one, which was released in 1961. With the Fantastic Four number one, and all books published from that point forward, we saw something that we had never really seen in comics up until this point, and that was a cohesive universe. A universe in which all the characters from all titles that the publisher was producing existed in. And what was even more crazy was that events that were happening in one title sometimes affected events that were happening in another title that people were not necessarily buying. Well, when this started happening, people started developing interest in other titles and they started picking up other titles because they wanted to know how the events in a title that they were currently reading were affecting events in other titles that they didn't necessarily buy. With this new direction the company was taking, Marvel really emerged as a forerunner in the comic book industry in the 1960s, and they really kind of created this fan frenzy. People just ate all of the Marvel comic books up in the 1960s, and Marvel just responded by creating even more hype with their books. And how did they do that, you're probably asking, besides interconnecting all the stories into one universe? Well, they did that with footnotes. We've all seen them in Marvel Comics from the 1960s, 70s, 80s, heck, we even see them in Marvel Comics today. And that is when a character in a particular title you were reading references an event that might have happened in another title, and there's this little star and a little message at the bottom that tells you, oh, for details about this, check out Incredible Hulk 195 in stores and on sale now. I don't know about you, but whenever I saw these little messages, I got so hyped and so excited and I'm like, I have to go find this issue right now to figure out what the heck happened. Everything is connected. I can't miss a thing that is happening in this universe right now. But I know what you were doing, Marvel. You were just trying to rub it in my face that I didn't know what the heck this character was talking about and I would get so mad that I would just go out and buy that book, thereby increasing your sales. With the creation of a cohesive universe and their little footnotes, Marvel very likely may have created the comic book collecting hobby. Believe it or not, before the 1960s, comic book collecting was not really a thing. Comic books were very disposable. Kids and adults would buy them, they would read them, and then they would maybe throw them out or keep them for a little while, roll them up, stick them in the back of their pocket, maybe trade them. But at the end of the day, no one really kept them, stuck them in poly bags or anything like that, and preserved them as works of art. So now because of this cohesive universe and all of these little notes that are telling you to check out their other titles so you know what's going on in the universe, people now started going and seeking out issues they may have missed of titles that they didn't typically read. So they were now actively searching for back issues. Well, we all know how benevolent of a company Marvel Comics is. So to help out their regular readers, they started running ads in their comic books around the time of the 1960s that were advertising dealers of comic book back issues. You can see these little ads in their comic books always advertising 
Comic books, 1939 to 1967. Huge stock, 100,000 plus. Marvel, DC, Golden Key, they would have them all. And that was the beginning of comic book collecting. And it wasn't really long before Marvel caught on to the fact that people weren't just reading their comic books, but they were collecting them. So with that in mind, Marvel started producing comics that were a little bit more appealing to the collector fan base. Definitely not to the same extent as they did in the 1990s, but you could still see it. Comic books as far back as the 1960s on the front page will have, this is for sure going to be a collector's item, or even later in the 1970s and 80s, they would have a big circle that overtly said, first issue collector's item. So throughout the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, Marvel produced this awesome universe and developed this really hardcore fan base. And Marvel may have appealed to collectors somewhat, but they were still producing very high quality content at their company in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Something strange happened in the 1980s, and that was the mainstream media and the news started running stories about golden age comic books selling for thousands and thousands of dollars. All of the people who read the very first superheroes in the 1930s were now very, very well-established adults by the 1980s, and some of them for nostalgic purposes, who had a little bit of money to spend, obviously, were going out and trying to find these comic books from their youth, and they were spending big money on them. With those types of stories that were running, a whole new flock of comic book buyers came to the market of already well-established comic book collectors, and those were comic book speculators. So let's fast forward to the year 1989, and this was a very interesting year for Marvel Comics. In 1989, a very prominent businessman by the name of Ron Perelman purchased Marvel Comics for $82.5 million. When Ron Perelman entered Marvel Comics, through his actions, he made one thing very clear, and that was he was not interested in producing good content. He was interested in making money. Perelman wanted to increase the sales of comic books. However, he didn't do this just by producing awesome content that people wanted to buy. He did this by partnering up with other companies that were involved in collectibles. Perelman bought shares in Toy Biz, which was a toy company. And he also bought shares in trading card companies and sticker companies and spent a total of $700 million. It was at this point that Marvel Comics started teaming up with these types of companies to start increasing the sales of their own comics. And you're probably asking, well, how exactly did they do that? Comic books and trading cards and stickers aren't exactly really that related. Oh, but Perelman found a way. And this was the beginning of all of those crazy gimmicks that the 1990s comic books are associated with. And which gimmicks were those, you're probably asking? Well, we all remember them, especially if we were around at the time, and those were polybagged editions of comic books, comic books that contained trading cards, s several special edition variant covers, die-cut covers, holographic chrome covers. The list is just endless of all these gimmicks that the comic book industry was engaging in. I want you all to smash that like button and leave me a thumbs up emoji in the comments if you fell for some of those gimmicks in the 1990s. I personally can tell you that I did not fall for any of these gimmicks and it's not because I was like this really super smart kid. It's just because I was like a total of like four years old when all this was happening. If you didn't fall for those 1990s gimmicks, but you are enjoying this video so far, please still consider leaving a like and check out the channel for other great videos on topics related to geek culture. Also, if you're not subscribed yet, please consider subscribing to this channel for more geeky fun. Now, there's nothing wrong with comic book collecting. We are all comic book collectors. We love this hobby. However, the problem with this new strategy that Marvel was taking was that they were producing comics exclusively for collectors and not people who actually liked to read comic books. That is, to me, a very bad business decision because the whole reason that we are actually in this hobby is because we like to read comic books. So if you're just producing for collectors and not readers, your sales are really going to be artificial and they're really not gonna be sustainable. 
So naturally, with comic book speculation already running rampant, the sales of comic books, and especially Marvel comic books, skyrocketed. Spider-Man number one, X-Force number one, X-Men number one. You've all seen these books on the channel before, and I've probably shared the stat with you that these books all hold records for the highest single issues of comic books ever sold. And it wasn't because that there were so many people that were reading these particular issues, it's because all of these issues all engaged in some sort of gimmick to increase sales. Spider-Man number one and X-Men number one both had multiple variant cover editions of the books. With Spider-Man, they had a standard edition, they had a silver edition, a gold edition, a platinum edition, and the X-Men cover all had variant covers that if you had all five of them and you put them together, they created this really kind of cool mosaic. This really appealed to collectors, so people bought not only one copy of each of these books, they bought multiple. And they thought by having all of these books, they would eventually be able to sell them at a high price, just like the Golden Age books, and get rich. X-Force number one was another huge gimmick. And for me, it was the gimmick that I feel really defined the 90s in comic books. X-Force number one was not only a polybagged comic book, but each comic book came with a trading card and it was a different trading card. So collectors would buy five copies of this book to get every single trading card in the poly bag, but they would not want to open any of them because they would be disturbing the original condition of that book. So they would buy a sixth one a lot of times just to be able to open it and read it. And that is how Ron Perelman cleverly incorporated trading cards and toys and, and other industries into comic books. With all of these gimmicks, Marvel's sales rose substantially and they were probably the highest they had ever been in the company's entire history. They were even outselling a lot of times their longtime competitor DC Comics. Now, DC was doing really well at this time too, and they did get involved with a lot of these gimmicks as well, you know, with the trading cards and the poly bags. But I really think that the bigger offender of the two companies really was Marvel Comics. Then in the early 1990s, Neil Gaiman, the author of Sandman and other amazing books, gave a speech warning comic book distributors about their current practices. He basically told them that, yeah, your sales are great right now, but you have to understand that there aren't this many people that are reading your books. They're just buying them for collectability and you're creating a bubble which is going to burst. And when it bursts, it will burst very hard. Of course, all of these publishers and distributors were blinded by greed and they did not heed Neil Gaiman's warning only for them to find that a few years later, sales of comic books plummeted, and they plummeted hard. People who bought multiple copies of these books then started trying to sell a lot of these books and found that they either couldn't sell these books, and if they could, they were maybe only getting a few bucks for them. So that took care of the comic book speculators. When they found they couldn't sell these books, they were all like, I'm out, I'm gone. The only people that still remained were actual fans of comic books. So publishers seeing that the sales dropped, they try to recover a lot of their losses and they started raising the prices of a lot of comic books and they were really, really taking advantage of their fans. Well, now actual fans of comic books started getting really, really pissed off and they left because the comic book collecting hobby was just too expensive and really not worth it to them. Not to mention that the quality of the books being produced at the time was overall not really good. And there are a few exceptions. I really do like a lot of 90s comics, but overall the quality was terrible and people were like, I'm not spending extra money for this shit. So that pretty much took care of everybody else that was buying comic books. And Marvel found that by 1996, their sales had plummeted 70 whopping percent to the point where Marvel had to declare bankruptcy. And it wasn't just Marvel Comics who was in trouble, every other publisher was in trouble as well. DC Comics, Image, Valiant, 
All these other smaller independent publishers that had appeared, a lot of them went belly up. A lot of these smaller independent publishers just ceased publication totally because the sales were so bad. The domino effect kicked in. Comic book shops started closing. Writers, artists started losing their jobs. It's just crazy how hard and how fast the industry fell. So at this point, Ron Perelman's strategy was to pretty much forget about comic books and try to get all of these characters on the big screen to recover losses. But by this point, a lot of shareholders were really, really pissed off to the point where Perelman was then gone. Marvel characters did eventually start hitting the big screen around 1998 with the Blade movie and two years later in 2000 with the first X-Men movie, but it happened without Ron Perelman. I find it really ironic that Marvel Comics was one of the hardest hit companies with the institution of the Comics Code Authority back in the 1950s, then they emerge as this industry giant only to pretty much almost destroy the comic book industry a second time in the 1990s with their business practices. So there you have it. Marvel Comics almost destroyed the comic book industry for a second time in the 1990s with their business practices and with the fact that they really kind of helped to establish the comic book collecting hobby back in the 1960s. So that about does it for a video today. I really, really hope that you enjoyed it. I would love to hear your thoughts on this topic in the comments. Until next time, this is Dante D signing off. I will see you all in the next episode.